This is the Practice of the Practice Podcast with Joe Sanok, session number 143. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and you're letting me into your ears and into your brain yet again. Thank you for letting me in. I hope you're doing awesome. Downtown Traverse City is beautiful right now. Our weather is in full bloom for the summer and did a lot of swimming over the weekend and stand up paddle boarding. And uh, it's interesting how sometimes, you know, as you're teaching people, you also get taught. uh, I'm in the midst of doing blog sprint right now, which is where a bunch of people, almost 30 people are all working together to write 10 blog posts in uh, two weeks. And I'm just so inspired by that group of people. And uh, Kelly Higdon did a talk at the Most Awesome Conference, taking you through kind of your ideal schedule. And a number of days uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've had my ideal schedule where I got up a little bit later, hung out with my family, went and worked and did some counseling and some consulting and blog sprint and was home by like three or four. And it's amazing the difference when you start to move towards just creating the schedule that you want rather than the schedule that you think that you need to have. And so it's super awesome. It's just super awesome. So I hope your week is going well and that you are looking at kind of how you're using your time. And yeah, so this week our sponsor uh, is Flow. And Flow is an app and software company that hopes to elevate the mental health community by strengthening the connections you have with your colleagues. Build a professional network full of the people you know and trust. See up-to-date details of their practice and current availability so that you can refer to them easier. Discover new people you'd like to get to know and hear the latest news on topics that you care about most and discuss with colleagues in a private, secure social network. Uh, It's so awesome. You can head on over to flowtherapist.com forward slash Joe and you'll actually get a month for free um, rather than the normal seven days. Uh, it's it's a great, great app that I think you, you guys are going to love. So head on over there and would love to hear your thoughts on it. And yeah, I'm just also really excited about today's guest, Amy Fortney Parks. Uh, she's just incredible. Uh, I've known her for probably about a year now. And she describes herself as a lifelong educator, a passionate psychologist, and often stressed out but mostly happy mom of four. She is the executive director of Wise Mind Solutions, a Northern Virginia-based practice focused on children, teens, and families. She's also the owner of The Wise Family, a comprehensive brand for kids and families designed to inspire educate and energize families. She brings over 25 25 years of education and experience working with children, adolescents, and families as a educator and psychologist. And what I love most about kind of what she's doing is that her focus includes not just individual counseling for kids, tweens, and teens, but she's also a passionate brain trainer. And so she's going to be talking with us today all about the brain and um, her use of brain technology in, uh, in groups, in uh, different groups that she works with. It's just, it's just really awesome. So without any further ado, I give you the one, the only, Amy. Amy Fortney Parks, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thanks, Joe. I'm a super fan. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. You have so many interesting stories about your life, about becoming a counselor, licensure, brain science. I'm just really excited to dive into all these different things. Thanks. Thanks. I think we all come from these really uh, interesting, you know, places to come to where we are. So it's going to be really fun to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So you you frame yourself as a lifelong educator. Let's start there. Tell me a little bit about your past and then how you kind of get into counseling. Well, um, I started out in college thinking I was going to be a doctor and I failed chemistry like big fat F. So that was not going to happen for me. Um, And so I started thinking, well, I really like to talk. And I started to get more and more interested in education. So when I graduated from college, I graduated with a degree, a, a dual degree in English and psychology, and then also a teaching licensure. And so I started in the teaching field in education, and I taught sixth grade for uh, a couple years. And I had gone to a private elementary school um, or, you know, private high school where there weren't any counselors or anything like that. And I didn't even know that 
schools had counselors. But one day I was talking to a friend of mine and I said, you know, I'm way more interested in whether or not, you know, these kids' parents are getting divorced or if they're having depression or anxiety or stress. I'm way more interested in that than teaching them about Shakespeare and all these other English <laughs> things that I'm doing. So I really, this is just, I, it's just not doing it for me. And my girlfriend said, well, why don't you become a school counselor? And I'm like, well, I didn't even know that was a job. I had no idea that was even a job. So I went back to school and got a master's degree. At that time, I was lucky enough to be able to get a, a dual master's degree in school psychology and school counseling, So, which is kind of unheard of nowadays. So uh, I went on to work in schools and as a school counselor and a school psychologist. And because I had that sort of combination of, of uh, degrees and the combination of training, I really became fascinated by the whole construct of, of learning and, and how our brains impact our ability to learn and, and how if we pay attention to how our brains work and if we know how our own brains work, how much more powerful our learning can be. So I just kind of, I became pretty fascinated with that and, and then started sort of following lots of folks that, that do brain types of science and brain work and, and then started speaking in the field of brain science. And now as an independent uh, therapist, I, I, I weave a lot of brain science into what I do with, with kids and teens and families. What's so interesting is usually it seems like people, you know, when they work with tweens and teens, uh, they're trying to get away from the teen and tween drama. But for you, it was that's the interesting part. I want to move from education into more kind of counseling and all the, the mess that might be going on in their lives. Yeah, uh, absolutely. What... And, you know, I'll tell you, teaching and, and really counseling is about sales. You know, I'm. it's really especially when you're working with teens and tweens and you know you ha you have to be about sales so you and you're trying to either sell a concept or you're trying to sell a position or you're trying to sell a strategy and so starting an education allowed me to really kind of get good at that and then as i started to work more and more and more in therapy i could sell kids more on the idea of hey let's get to know your brain a little bit so you can figure out how to maximize what you know I, I love that you say that. Be, it's in, I love that you say it because I said something similar when I was speaking at the Michigan School Social Worker Conference, um, where it was all about how you're always marketing. And I had this room full of social workers that worked in the schools, and I asked them, how many of you think that you're marketers? And like one person raised their hand. And oh. I said, why do you think you're a marketer? Um, and the person said, well, I used to be in marketing, and now I'm a school social worker, and I'm always selling ideas to them. And like that was the premise of my whole talk. And by the end, you know, just the basics of social media, marketing, and how that interacts with selling an idea, uh, we kind of went through that process. And so hearing you say that, it's amazing how these ideas like echo to different people in different places, but it's such a like common idea. Yep. I totally, I totally feel that way. And in fact, I think when you think about your work as sales, uh, it's a whole lot easier to um, get excited about it. Uh, I, I just it just it, it seems to be for me something that I can get a whole lot more excited about because I, I believe in it so much. I yeah. think you can't sell anything you don't believe in. And generally, people that are in this business in education or in counseling, you know, aren't in it really for the big bucks. Um, but they're in it because they really believe in in the power of of this kind of work. And so it's easy to sell something when you believe in it. So I, you know, I say go for it. It, it sure is. I, I know that I sold vacuum cleaners door to door in college, and I did not believe in the product one bit. So I only sold two and a half. There you go. So, yeah. It wait, was, wait. How do you sell half a vacuum? <laughs> I got so sick of doing it alone that I recruited a friend to go with me, and so we sold the vacuum, and I had to split the profits with her. <laughs> I was like so sick of just driving around the county all by myself selling vacuum cleaners. I'm like, just ride with me. You don't even have to know what you're doing. Like, yeah, it's so painful. So and, and that's, it's painful in work too. If you really, if you, if you're having a bad day, is therapist or you or you or you're really feeling um you know put upon by a family it can make selling hard so you know that's that's the same kind of situation Absolutely. that we have sometime in our work too i'm really interested in the idea of selling brain science to tweens and teens like what were some <laughs> of the techniques you did or how did you make that interesting to them well, I, I do it every day, so I'm definitely not talking about it in the past tense. Sure. Um, but yeah, I um, so 
one of the things I, I always start with is just noticing some of the things and bringing to awareness some of the things I see when I'm talking to, to specifically, I think, tweens and teens, you know, like 12 and up. Although younger kids, um, I'll often mention to the parents, especially with kids around like third grade, like eight, nine, 10, that that's a super tsunami of the right brain. And so when you see lots of emotionality and tantruming around that age, they're like, I thought we pa- were past this already. And I s- kind of help them understand what's happening in the brain so they can sort of normalize it a little bit. But with teens and tweens, and you, I really- sorry, I want to pause you. So how do you yeah. describe that to them? So there's many of us that are listening right now that maybe don't know how to describe what's happening during that age. Like, How would you describe the brain in that eight to 10 age? Well, so, you know, one of the things that we think about that's that's not true is that our brains just are kind of growing all over the place all the time. And it, and it really, it's just like the body in that everything grows in hierarchical way. So the brain develops and different parts of the brain cue other parts of the brain to develop. So, it, you know, certainly lots of things are happening at one time, but certain parts of the brain have to cue others to begin developing um, after they've reached maturity. So, and oftentimes too, you'll see, for example, a younger child, say kindergarten or first grade, who's learning to read, who won't grow physically for a period of time and parents will get a little bit worried. And I explain to them, you know, if the brain is doing a lot of work, it can't focus on growing the body. So you'll have like a period of time of no body growth, or you'll see a super surge of body growth and kids won't move up a level in reading or math or something and people will be panicked about that. And I talk about, you know, we we develop in this hierarchical way. So um, when I explain that to parents, I say, you know, there are different times in in development where different parts of the brain are developing at different rates and at different times. And around that eight or nine, and there are several books about this that are very, very helpful. Um, Your Child's Brain is, is a really good one. And Um, I'm trying to, I don't have my glasses on to see across my office, (laughs) some more titles, but I can absolutely um, and happily share them with you. um, Yeah, and we'll put those in the show notes after you Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple really good ones. But um, I I say, you know, around that age, the left brain has done a lot of its work in terms of building some early reasoning skills. And so the right brain starts to do some of its work in building some emotional resilience and some some emotional stability and reactivity and understanding emotional language and things like that. And so I try to explain that when you see this big amount of left of right brain growth, it's, I call it the tsunami of the right brain because it's really flooding the brain with right brain activity, super, super creative, super, super emotional. And the left brain is actually the part which is asking lots of questions, super why, how does this work, putting things together, taking things apart, which you see a lot in the younger, say like five and six ages. The, this is There's no exclusivity here. I mean, you see mm-hmm. these things all throughout, but, but sometimes it's more pronounced than others. So I just try to kind of point that out. And regardless of, of the age of the person I'm talking to, I just try to bring it to their awareness as a way of saying, you know, this is the one organ that we treat in the body, the only organ that we treat in the body that we can't see. Now, actually, we can start to see it a a lot more than we used to be able to through functional magnetic resonance imaging, but we haven't been able to really see it for a long, long time, but we we treat it. So that usually gives people a pretty good aha about yeah, things. I would imagine that for parents that are seeing tantrums or seeing more of that right brain activity to realize this is something that their brain naturally is doing. This isn't that your kid is, you know, headed down onto like the autism spectrum or they're into oppositional defiant disorder. Like we're right. so quick to label, but to say this is a normal phase for a normal child to go through. Right. Right. Exactly. And and. And that does just because it's a, a typical for, phase for a child to go through doesn't mean we have to say it's okay. We sure. still have to handle and manage the behaviors, but we can understand it a little bit more. And I'm I'm really believe very strongly that when you understand something more, it's easier to manage. Mm-hmm. It might not make it, it. It might not. Well, I don't know. Maybe the word isn't easier. I guess. Um, well, maybe there's more empathy yes, to at least I think understand that, what's happening. 
Yeah, it's there's there's more empathy around the under uh, and understanding it, and so then it it kind of makes the makes the problem solving process a little less laborious and a little bit more focused on a solution. We're going to figure something out, and it's going to get better. I guess it gives it hope. Too. Sure, sure. Yeah. So for teens and parents of teens, how do you work with them in regards to kind of selling them on the brain and helping them understand what's happening with the brain? Well, a lot of times uh, those conversations start because I've done some testing. So I do some I do testing in my office on, for learning disabilities and ADHD and and some executive function things. And so some of those conversations start by having done some actual diagnostic uh, psychoeducational testing. And so then I can start from there. But if that's not the case, then um, we do focus on things like. Um, the, the changes that are happening in the brain. For example, one of the things, there are two very strong periods of growth for the brain that happen in life. One is around three years old, and then one is around 14 years old. Those are huge blossoming times of the brain. And blossoming means when we create just thousands, millions of new neurons. And so when you have a 14 year old and you have and i and i show this little visual thing i have these little pipe cleaners and it's got all these dendrites and it looks like this really complicated complex tree but uh when you've got all this blossoming you you it's confusing it really it clouds up and clogs up your brain and so that fuzzy brain thing of trying to make decisions and trying to sort through things and trying to manage a life as a teenager I talk about some of that's really normal and all of that's actually really normal because we as adults, we say things like, oh my gosh, you know, she's so stressed out. I can't figure out why she's so stressed out. All she has to do is go to school and go to softball. How hard is that? But we've normalized the experience of stress and teenagers haven't. And so we have to help them see, you know, a lot of stuff is happening in your brain right now. It's pretty busy and you're creating a lot of Neuro, neurochemicals and your uh, neurotransmitters are in high high uh, production. Then also, let's not forget hormones are in super super high production. So we've got lots of stuff happening. So I really kind of share that, and you really see oftentimes a visible relaxation in families because they're like, okay, I hear what you're saying. This isn't the end of the world. You know, this is just part of the process. And I kind of just say, you know, it's it's okay. It's going to be okay. Here's where we're going to put some supports in place, and here we're where's where we're going to, you know, shore up some of the things that are not feeling so good. Wow. So I imagine as you see parents understand that that they kind of change their direction. Uh, but what about like? So I'm thinking about different topics of the brain that come up frequently for the teenagers I see, and one mm -hmm. is sleep drug use, um, those kind of things that can affect the brain long term. Mm -hmm. um, how do you talk about sleep with kids in relation to the brain? How do you talk with them about drug use and those sorts of things? Yeah. Well, sleep, I kind of make it a joke. I say something like, you know, do you, is it hard for you to get to school every day? And of course the answer is always yes. And then I say, well, but when you're in school, you know, do you actually try to listen or try to get any learning, to ha you know, to happen. And they're like, oh, well, yes, of course. I, you know, I try to work and I listen. I said, well, you know what? If you're not sleeping at night, you shouldn't bother. You just shouldn't bother. And I just kind of make it a joke. And they're like, what do you mean? This lady's telling me not to go to school or not to learn. And I said, <laughs> well, 80% of the encoding that you do to remember the things you learned today at school happens while you sleep. So if you're not sleeping, what's the point? <laughs> you know, you're, right. you're just, you're not getting anything. You're not saving or, or retaining or encoding anything. And we spend a lot of time focusing on sleep. In fact, when people come in my office and their first complaint is anxiety or depression, you know, the first thing I talk about is sleep and the first thing I want to fix is sleep. Now, there are certain things that, that are happening in the brain, um, certain neurotransmitter productions that are happening and reductions that are happening in the brain. Like there's a lot of... Um, Girls tend to make more serotonin than boys do in their brains, and so we see a lot of sleep issues with boys more than often than girls. But there's some there's a lot of disruption in those neurotransmitter productions, so that can really disrupt sleep. And so we talk a lot about why it's important to sleep and um, and how to make that happen. And I usually show them there's some really good videos online about 
um, by by a couple. Dan Siegel, for example, who's a um, a great neuroscientist, and he talks about how watching screens even within an hour before sleep can completely disrupt your cycle of of uh, sleep serotonin production. And so I usually show that. I usually do some fact-based sort of information. I just don't say something like, hey, you got to go to sleep because they've heard that before. So I put it in the context of here's the facts and this is how your brain works. And you can either fight it or you can, you know, work with it. But yeah. that's, the, that's the deal there. As far as drugs are concerned, um, you know, a lot of times you see kids that are uh, looking at and, and participating in, you know, smoking pot or drug use or something like that as a way of self-medicating. So I, I try to really look underneath a lot of that and see what's, what's happening. Um, there can be lots of stuff, you know, you and I both know there's lots of stuff going on with, with a lot of those kinds of things. But oftentimes it's self-medicating because something else is really um, – really in the way, like anxiety is in the way. And, and anxiety is like a wool blanket over the brain. It can just really stop you from getting anything accomplished. Mm. And, um, and then there are certain neurochemicals also that are being made in the brain. And, and as I said before, that are in sort of various levels of production that we, we can get um, and that feel really good um, from illegal substances. You know, like, for example, dopamine. You know, we can get dopamine from meth. Hey, mm -hmm. you know, if I can go buy that on the street, why, why wouldn't I? Um, that's the logic sometimes. So that's pretty tricky. Yeah, yeah. Well, so how did you, like, first get into being this interested in the brain? Because I think we all recognize that the brain is important. But to, to put in all the extra work, what was it that it kind of changed in you to say, I have to know more about the brain in particular? Um... I don't remember if there was a specific moment. Um, I know when I started my career, I was doing a lot of teasing out of dyslexia and different types of learning disabilities. And so I guess the more I found out and figured out and the more I was able to bring that information into my practice, I guess the more interested I became in it. And then when I started to talk to people about it, they became more interested, which sort of ignited my enthusiasm for it even more. So, you know, I, I, I speak a lot to, um, to groups about the brain and I write a lot about the brain and people are always fascinated to be able to hear about the brain, but not from a, like there's a lot of Greek words that describe different parts of the brain, you know, hippocampus and, and you know, um, cerebellum and lots of different words that are complicated. And I try to make them really easy. And I, I specifically have learned some strategies for, you know, brain 101. You know, like I say something like, for example, um, in fact, my son, uh, I have a son who's in college and he's taking a psychology class and he, the psychology 101 class has got brain anatomy and he's trying to remember the different parts of the brain. And I was able to really give him some easy ways to the, remember them. So like, for example, hippocampus, the hippocampus is responsible for memory and it's kind of like the UPS man of the brain. You know, it takes stuff from one part of the brain and delivers it to another. And you can remember it because, see, if you had a hippo on your campus, you would totally remember that. <laughs> and, you know, and he was like, oh, that's great. I can totally, you know, I can totally get that. And, um, you know, so, so I try to really make it, make it, you know, um, easy versus trying to be super complicated because why – it's no fun if you can't – remember something or you can't understand it because it's so complicated. Right. So your practice, you focused on brains, teens, families, tweens. How important do you think it is for people that own a business to focus in on a specialty versus being a generalist? I think that's such a great question because I see so many. So I've been in practice. Well, I've been working in this field for nearly 25 years. I've been in private practice for about 10. And um, it's so interesting because I see so many people trying to just, um, see as many people as they can from all different, different domains. But I really think it's critical to focus on something. First of all, I think it's critical for your own, um, your own sense of 
mastery because you cannot know everything about everything. It's just impossible. And so I really value being an expert in certain areas, in teens and in parents of teens uh, and, and using this brain science as part of that. So I think that's really critical. But I think also, you know, people want to go to you when they know you're an expert. If they know you're just, you can do a little bit of everything, I don't think you have as much value. And, and then how do you figure out who your ideal client is? Because then you have like 12 ideal clients. Mm -hmm. So that makes your life really tricky in terms of figuring out how do I market and I think people come to this work with a feeling like, oh, I have to be all things to all people. But really, I don't think that serves anybody, you or your clients, if you're trying to be all things to all people. I, I totally agree. I was just listening to Grant Baldwin's Speaker Lab podcast, and he was talking yes. about speakers. And I loved the analogy he used. He said, if you go into a restaurant and you were like, can I see the menu? And they said, oh, we can make anything. Just tell us what you want to make, what you want made. You'd be really, you'd be like, what? Are you kidding me? And rather than, you know, I can make Italian, I can make Mexican food, I can make Chinese food, I can make American. Like you, you would say you probably don't do any of those very well. Whereas if you go right. to a place that's just, you know, an amazing taco truck, uh, they're probably right. going to have pretty good tacos. Right, exactly. And imagine if you're, if you're a chef and you can make all that stuff, how big your toolbox has to be. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And some of those tools in that toolbox you might only use, say, once a year because someone comes in and they want, you know, uh, sushi, you know, one time. Well, you only use that tool one time. You certainly can't be good at that if you just use it one time. Right. If you use a tool several times a day, every single day, then you become absolutely a master at that. And, and brain science proves that too. Um, you know, when we do something, think of any habit that you have that you've tried to break. You do something over and over again. It feels super good to keep doing it. You don't want to change that. So imagine if you have to pick up a new tool that you've never used. It's the exact same kind of thing. So in terms of practice, I think it's really critical um, to be to be an expert in, in at least, a, you know, one area, if not maybe a couple so it sounds like for growing a business, uh, it's really important to kind of specialize. What are other kind of structural things that you found helpful in growing your private practice? Well, my my private practice started, um, it, it was really interesting because getting licensed in my state, I live in Virginia, and we have the most difficult licensure process in the whole country. And um, and. That's I, I guess that's great in that it, maybe it's very stringent. Uh, there are only two states in the whole country that require now trauma-informed um, education, Iowa and Virginia. So that's really interesting. But um, it started out really in a tricky way because the, the licensure board lost my paperwork and then I had to refile my paperwork and then they changed the laws so I had to get grandfathered in because I got my master's degree in like a million and one years ago in 1994 and it was so interesting because I said look you guys are punishing me because in 1994 I didn't know I want to go I wanted to go into private practice so um, a little aside I would say for your l listeners is if you're in school right now, keep every single syllabus from every single class you ever take. <laughs> right. Because 20 years from now, your professors will be dead and you will not have <laughs> access to that information. So yeah. that's, that's my, little, my little word of wisdom there. But um, I think the thing about pra practice that's been really helpful to me is to be really – have a strong expertise in a couple areas – but to be able to hit those areas in a variety of ways. So, for example, I can work with somebody in the context of counseling. I can work with them by doing assessments. I can work with them um, using a workbook or worksheet strategy. Um, I now use the Muse meditation program in my office, which is really Yay, super Muse. fun. Everyone should totally be using Muse. Choose Muse.org. And... Um, I think that, so I use that. So a lot of different ways I, I tackle things. So I don't have to just have one size fits all way of approaching the problem. So I guess it's a little contradictory to what I was saying re earlier regarding the toolbox, but it's not so much in that I have only a few tools, but I can use them in lots of creative ways. Yeah. And they're all centered around kind of one theme. Yes. So yes. that you can kind of adapt to each situation. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. And, and there's lots of cool stuff. So, but you have to figure out what you're really good at. And, and actually it makes life so much easier. You know, when I see somebody, I'm on, you know, certain listservs and they say, I'm looking for a therapist who can work with a veteran with PTSD. And I think, nope, not me. Nope. Mm -hmm. not me. Yep. Oh, that's me. And that's really helpful because it's exhausting if you have to answer all that all the time and be everything to everyone. It just, you can't. Yeah. Tell me how you're using Muse in your sessions. Well, I just started because I needed to get good at it. My, not good at it. I needed to do it myself. Sure. So I've done it myself for a couple of weeks and it's super, super fun. And I'm up to like 45 birds, which is so fun. What? Oh, um, yeah, I know. You 45 bird people. Well, let's start with like, what is Muse? Just so people can kind of visualize it that have never heard sure. of it. Okay. Well, so, you know, I'm, I'm a super fan of, of the practice of the practice. So I listen to most of your podcasts, which probably sounds a little creepy, but no, it's awesome. <laughs> I, I, I got onto Muse because you mentioned it and I talked to the people at Muse at length because I'm a super brainiac and I needed to know what I was doing. And, um, and they were like, Oh my God, you're going to use it with kids. And I said, yes, yes, yes. I really want to. So I got my headset and Muse is a, is a fabulous app. And how I explain it to, to kids and families is that what you do is it's kind of like neurofeedback, but it's very non-invasive. And you put this headphone on his headband thing on your head and through Bluetooth, it talks to your phone and you in an app, you can basically control the weather. And that's pretty much what I explained. With your and mind. Then, <laughs> yeah, with your mind, with your brain. And it's I just think it's the coolest thing ever. And um, and I'm just starting to use it with patients. So I just cool. used it with a kid who's nine the other day and he was just fascinated but freaked out. So <laughs> that's okay. I think that's part of the whole learning curve process. Sure. I don't know if I'm going to start every session using Muse, but I, I want to start um, integrating it more into the early parts of, of many sessions with my patients. I haven't tried it on teenagers yet just because I haven't, I just haven't uh, I haven't yet, but I'm I've going done it to probably mostly with teenagers and yeah. they love it. Um, it's interesting. I had um, one client that was a teen girl and she and her parents, like many teen girls and boys were fighting over how much she was on screens. Um, and they were like, she just can't focus. She can't like do what she's supposed to do. And so I said to her, well, what if we did muse just to show your parents like how calm you can be and how focused you can be. And I think she got like 50% her first time with like 10 birds or something ah, like that. Oh, wow. um, and I've had other clients that, you know, are labeled as ADHD or whatever. And they're supposedly all scattered and can't calm down and they get 71%. And I had one kid get 30 birds uh, right. yesterday on his very first time. And I'm like, yeah, I've, I've never passed 10. Birds, for your listeners, we should explain that the birds are, you, when you're super calm and you're and you're able to really control the weather to make it calm and peaceful, you hear birds chirping. Oh, and so you want yeah. the birds as much as possible. Um, but at the same time, though, Joe, you don't want to react to the birds if you hear one. If you react, that messes you up. That's what I do. I hear one, I get so excited because they're so yeah. rare. Whereas this other kid yeah. had a freaking tropical jungle going on. <laughs> you can't, you can't react. I, I so react. Or if I hear like um, it get really calm, then I'm like, all right, again. And then all of a sudden, like the wind yep. is picked back up again. Yep. Yep. Oh. Now, I don't know if I'm supposed to be setting up different accounts for each kid or if I'm supposed to just be setting up lots of accounts under my account. See, I find it way easier to just use my one app um, rather than having unique accounts. And then I just write in the progress notes kind of what they were at. Because uh, I don't want to have, you know, they're not focusing on being like HIPAA compliant and all of that. And I don't want any, even if they're, they don't have names on it. I don't know. I just want it all under one. Yeah, that would be easier. I just didn't realize I could do that until the other day. I'm like, yeah. oh, this is so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, what's really cool. So the most awesome conference, um, Ben from Muse was able to get every single person that comes a free Muse. And so we've been sending those out to all the participants for most awesome conference. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I'm so sorry that I'm not going to be able to be there, but it's my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. So I have to go to La Jolla next year. It still needs to be in La Jolla. There is, there has to be there. It has to be there. <laughs> Well, well, we're hearing that from a lot of people, so hopefully we keep it in La Jolla. And we we do it again. Our goal is to do it again, but you know, every year we got to evaluate. So yeah, I get yeah, it. but your your parents' fiftieth is uh, pretty darn important. Yeah, so. yeah, I think so too. 
Yeah, so I guess in regards to running a practice, running a business, any quick tips, like maybe three quick tips for people that are in the earlier stages? You've got this dynamic, amazing practice, and you're doing all the speaking, and you have it down. Um, what would you suggest to people that are in that either startup phase or kind of starting to grow phase to just think about how to grow their business? Well, I think the number one thing that, that I think is most important is that if you are nervous about speaking in front of a group, figure out how to get over that. Because the number one way you're going to promote yourself and your practice and the, the profession in general and the, and the gift of therapy is to be able to talk to groups. So if you're afraid of talking to groups, join a Toastmasters, you know, reach out to me and I'll kind of give you some tips um, or you know, talk to people that you know that, that can speak to groups because that's going to be a really important means of of really sharing what you can do and what you know and and spreading the spreading the love um so that would be i think the number one thing i would say but a couple other things um that i think are important i definitely would say don't stop learning don't stop going to conferences don't stop reading don't stop following up on articles that um you know that are in your niche don't stop because I know so many people who just don't take advantage or they do the bare minimum of, the, of their CEUs for the year and they just, that's all they do and, and they don't really try to learn anything new. Um, so that's, I think, a huge mistake. So I think that that's also really important. And then I think the third thing I would say that's most important if you work with teens is you have to know about social media you have to know about stuff that's happening with teens. And if you don't, then you need to get a focus group together of teenagers or you need to get some parents and kids, teenagers together. You need to start figuring those things out because I, I met a whole bunch of therapists last night uh, at, this, at this event and we were talking about teenagers and a couple of them said, oh, well, uh, I don't have any, they, don't, they didn't have teenagers in their home, fine, no big deal. But they're like, oh, I'm not really on any social media. I'm like, well, you're making a big mistake because you do not know what's happening in the teen world enough to be able to be effective. Totally. Um, I totally agree with that. Kids, I, I am absolutely convinced um, that, that we're losing the art of listening. And, um, and so I'll, I'll give your readers like a little secret um, thing. I'm writing a book, Joe, and I'll tell you the book title. I know the book title. It's Living the Life You Want Your Kids to Lead. And it's about really being a model um, for teenagers and it, it's for educators and clinician, clinicians and parents. And that's a big part of it is if you, you know, your t teenagers are on social media, there's no way getting around that. So you have to know, you have to know what they're doing and that's you have to understand awesome. it. You can't just say, Oh, haha, ha, that's cute. I don't understand it, but that's really cute. No, you have to know it. That's awesome. When do you think that that book's going to be completed or is it just kind Not of- Not until probably a year from now. So I'm just giving you a way far heads up. Well, you'll have to just come <laughs> back. You'll just have to come back once that thing's done so that we I can will, talk about totally. it and promote it because I, really I know it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Well, Amy, if every counselor in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? If every counselor in the world were listening right now, I would want them to know that they should not- do their work in isolation, that you need to have a, a staffing group, you need to have an online community, you need to be part of the consultant school, you need to be working with other people who are in the field um, so that you can get ideas, you can share insights, you can get support, because we do a lot of really, really hard work and we are not all the greatest at self-care. And you have to have other people in your world to be supporting you and to be with you along this journey because you just you just can't you are, you can't do it alone. You should not do it alone. If you're doing it alone, you, you can't be doing it well. I love that you wove the consultant school in there. <laughs> Thanks for that little <laughs> drop I'm of such name. A good suck up. <laughs> <laughs> the consultant school or consulting with Joe or no, I'm just kidding. Well, it's so valuable. I mean, just hopping on a Facebook group with you know five or six clinicians or you know elementary school counselors or um, you know people that are working with teens. I mean, it's just so powerful. Parents work together. Get to get to know other parents that that have teenagers. You don't have to be perfect. 
you don't have to make apologies for yourself. You just go in there and you say, here's me. This is what I need. And get what you need from people. It's really important, I, I think. I love it. And you're giving away your 12 Habits of a Wise Family book to the listeners. Tell people how they can download that. I am. So um, they can download the book by going to my website at www.thewisefamily.com. And if they sign up for my weekly Wise Words, which is um, a great weekly little e-blast, um, usually about something about the brain or right now I'm doing a series on um, the four agreements of a for a middle schooler. So you've, have you ever read the four mm-hmm. agreements, yep. the book? So I'm doing a, a, a series right now with the four agreements of for a middle schooler. So that's really, it's really cool um, series. But they can just sign up there and then they'll get the uh, e-book, the 12 Habits of a Wise Family um, automatically sent to them by email. That's awesome. So head on over to thewisefamily.com and you can learn more about Amy there. Uh, Amy, thank you so much for being on the Practice of the Practice podcast. Of course. I'm thrilled, Joe, and I'll look forward to talking to you again when the book comes out. Sounds good. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care. One thing Amy said right at the end there that I just want to like go back to because she just kind of breezed over it, her idea of the four agreements for middle schoolers. So frequently we think we have to start from total scratch in regards to creating content for people. And I think that's a great example of using something that's already known in culture and then kind of taking your own spin on it, thinking about it, and making sure that people really understand uh, kind of what you're teaching, but you can use it in a certain cultural context that people already get. So I'm so excited about flow uh, for therapists. Head on over to practiceofthepractice.com forward slash session 143, and you can get your free 30 days to test it out, check it out, um, see what you think of it. I'd love to hear your feedback uh, just so that I can tell other people uh, what you're telling me. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain and have an amazing week. Bye. Special thanks to the band Silences Sexy and Devin Elizabeth. We like your music and this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the publisher, or the guests are rendered legal or conscious clinical or other professional information. So you don't need it on the professional. You should find one. Bye.